Yeah, I just continue. Uh, uh, okay. Si, si, lo so okay, so there are two monitors. I don't know where to stay. I start here. Okay, so again, welcome everybody. It's a pleasure to be here and to give uh, this. Uh, this introduction on quantum computing and application in natural sciences. So here is uh, the outline of uh, this presentation. First, I will give you a short uh, overview on uh, quantum computing and applications. So, oops. No, I just went. <laughs> Thank you. So a few notions about quantum computing to begin with. Then also I will introduce the concept of near-term quantum computing and also an overview on the application modules that we have in Qiskit. So Panos was here for the entire week and maybe already discussed with you about Qiskit and how we want to interface Qiskit with classical drivers like Vanier and other codes. And then in the second half, uh, we talk about uh, some developments uh, towards uh, quantum advantage. Obviously, we are not yet there, but uh, we are building up uh, all uh, uh, the tools, uh, starting from the hardware, but also software and algorithms uh, in order to reach quantum advantage uh, in the domain of natural sciences. And then here I selected uh, topics on electronic structure calculations, where I will focus on scaling up uh, functionalities. So how do we bring uh, this? Uh, so, uh, so early stages in quantum computing uh, to systems uh, that uh, can be of interest uh, uh, in chemistry, material science, and so forth. Uh, and then at the end, if I have time, I will also introduce uh, the, the topic of quantum dynamics. And the reason for that is because we believe that quantum advantage could be something demonstrated for, for quantum dynamics before electronic structure calculations. Okay, so gates. I will start with this very technical slide about the gate operations that you perform. You know that in quantum computing, you operate on a qubit register and at uh, the, the kind of operations that uh, you can perform in digital based quantum computers are, are given here. In near term quantum computing, uh, you have access uh, to gates uh, that we call U3 gates uh, that are uh, rotations on the block sphere of uh, uh, the single qubits. Unfortunately, these uh, gates uh, cannot be error corrected. And therefore, when we will move to a uh, fault tolerant, uh, so uh, error corrected uh, quantum computing, uh, then we will have to replace uh, these uh, U3 gates that uh, you will see uh, during my talk uh, with uh, a universal gate set. Uh, so made of, uh, and this is written here, oh no, sorry, made of uh, T gates. Sorry, some, okay. Cool, thank you. So let's go to the next one, but no, this doesn't work. Cool, thank you. Okay, so how does it work? So we start preparing an initial state that it can be a simple uh, uh, product, uh, direct product of uh, the, the qubit states, uh, qubit zero to qubit n. So you have n plus one qubits. Each uh, qubit uh, can take uh, a superposition of uh, these two states, zero and one. And if you introduce a basis, uh, for instance, uh, for two qubits, uh, you will have a state defined by this vector here. And then we need a circuit, right? So the circuit will perform the operations that I mentioned before. So these are one qubit gate operations that work on a qubit register. And then you have these other gates here that are two qubit gates that induces entanglement between this line 
and this line. So without entanglement, uh, any uh, quantum circuit uh, could be simulated easily classically. But at the moment you introduce uh, entanglement, then the size of your space becomes n to the power of two, where n is again the number of qubits, meaning that uh, with uh, 50 qubits, uh, you reach a size that cannot be handled anymore by a classical computer because two to the 50, you cannot place it in the memory of any computer. And if you could, then you go to 51 qubits. And again, you cannot anymore because every time you add a qubit, you double the size of the space. So whatever you try to do classically, every time you reach a result, then the day after, I mean, I just add one qubit and then it's over again. And what you build in the circuit is a linear combination of all possible states. So two to the n states of your system. And the algorithm is indeed about creating a circuit that is expressive enough that contains the solution of your problem. Okay? Then in a VQE that I will introduce later on, variational quantum eigensolver, then you will optimize the parameters of these uh, uh, single qubit gates that uh, um, will give you the coefficients in this distribution. And then by optimizing this object, you will get the solution of your problem. Right? So here I also introduced the concept of uh, repeating blocks. So the circuits uh, very often is given by repeating blocks. More blocks you add, more expressivity you add to your circuit because all, uh, all of these blocks here have an independent parameterization. So they are the same in shape, but with different uh, parameters. Obviously, if you want to cover the full Hilbert space, you need exponentially many uh, gates, right? Parameters. But uh, obviously in quantum computing, we aim to get an approximate solution with a polynomial number of gates. And there is a theorem, the uh, solowev kitaev theorem that tells you that if you are allowed to give a tolerance in, uh, so a, a, an epsilon in the precision that you want to reach, then uh, there is a polynomial number of uh, gate operations that uh, could get you to that precision. Okay, so, so far everything is uh, pretty simple. Then at the end, you need to measure in order to get out uh, results, right? And then you will measure a state and uh, this, the, the, the results of this measurement will be uh, given to uh, um, a classical bit of information. And how you do that, you do it by a measurement process. So you need to collapse the state that you generate in the qubit register into a, a, a bit string, what we call a bit string, which is one element of your expansion that you have here below, right? And each of these outcome will show up with a probability that is the square of the amplitude in front of that state. So this means that uh, when you measure an observable, uh, you will not get a single value, so the, the expectation value, but you will get a distribution of values, right? Because you collect from this distribution here with the weights that are pi is the square of the amplitudes. So more measurements you do and uh, smaller will become the standard deviations of your distribution, meaning that if you want an accurate result, with near-term quantum computing, you have to repeat the measurements many times so that uh, this distribution at the end in the limit of infinite measurements will collapse on a delta function. Okay, so the errors uh, that we will do with near-term quantum computers, so not fault tolerance, or, uh, meaning that the gates are not uh, corrected, the errors that you do on the gate operations, so uh, within this framework, we do errors uh, in uh, setting up uh, these uh, rotations on the single qubits, on the block sphere of the single qubits. So when you have to set, uh, so an angle, uh, an Euler angle of uh, theta and phi, right? You do it with an error, and this obviously will uh, will cause, uh, um, yeah, an error on the final result. In addition, you have the decoherence of the qubits. The qubits uh, decohere with uh, a characteristic time that is called T1, that is in the order of a uh, few hundreds of uh, microseconds. 
and uh, and therefore you need to, to to complete the execution of the the circuits before the qubit starts to decohere. This is another source of error. So these are two errors. So how to set the the block spheres, uh, the, the angles on the block spheres, the decoherence error, and then we have also errors at done at the measurement, and uh, errors coming from uh, the statistics of, uh, uh, of this distribution here. So the fact that uh, what we call statistical noise because you need more and more measurements in order to achieve a good accuracy of your results so this is really quantum computing in a nutshell now let's have a look at what is the difference between near term and fault tolerant quantum computing so in fault tolerant quantum computing which means that uh, you have an additional layer that allows you to correct for the errors that you do in the single qubit operations. In order to encode these error correction codes, you would need something like 1000 physical qubits for each uh, logical error corrected qubit. So this means that uh, is not something that we can do today because we have a few hundreds of uh, qubits at the moment. And here you need 1000 to error correct a single logical qubit is something for the next decade, most probably, right? It would take uh, five to 10 years to reach uh, that now. Then uh, for, to do that, we need uh, new hardware developments because the um, smaller you do the single, uh, you can make uh, the single qubit error, then the less uh, physical qubits you will need to generate a single logical qubit. Then I mentioned already before, you, you, don't, you cannot correct uh, U3 gates. Then you need uh, uh, to decompose this into a universal gate set, as I mentioned before, Clifford plus T gates. That's also induce, introduces uh, more gates and a longer circuit depth. But on the other end, if you have a fault tolerant quantum computing, then you have well known quantum algorithms that can provide a quantum advantage. And this is the work of the mathematicians, right? So the mathematicians proved that the day we will have fault tolerant quantum computing, then you can solve many quantum mechanical problems with speed up. So that can be exponential or polynomial speed up. And also classical problems in statistical physics can be solved more efficiently with a quantum computer. There are theorems like, uh, I mean, the Shore algorithm that uh, can factorize uh, numbers with exponential speed up. Uh, and we have uh, Grover search that allows you to find, uh, I mean, uh, uh, data in uh, unstructured uh, databases uh, uh, with uh, polynomial speed up. Okay, so, but this, as I mentioned, is more for the future. My talk will be mainly about near-term quantum computing. So using uh, uh, physical qubits instead of logical qubits. So the, the, the problem is that we need uh, to cope with uh, the gate errors, the qubit decoherence and statistical errors that I've introduced uh, a moment ago, but we have uh, error mitigation schemes that helps to mitigate these kind of problems. We therefore have a limited number of qubits and circuit depth because these errors accumulate in a way and therefore more qubits you have and deeper is your circuit, larger would be, would be the impact of, the, of these errors. But also in this case, we have a very active research on quantum algorithms to demonstrate quantum advantage. So quantum mechanics is definitely one of the topics where we aim to get quantum advantage with near-term quantum computing. And here I'm talking about quantum chemistry, many body physics, and also high energy physics. Uh, think about lattice gauge theory, for instance. But as I mentioned, also classical problems may one day become so, um, solvable with uh, near-term quantum computing. This is uh, less clear what kind of advantage you will have for classical optimization problems with near-term quantum computing. And then you have a quantum machine learning. That's another class of uh, say algorithms that uh, 
uh, using uh, neural networks and uh, support vector machines can provide quantum advantage in the near future. Okay. So again, to summarize, our goal is to achieve quantum advantage with near-term quantum computer computers. We need a noise resilient quantum algorithms, and this is why we need to continue uh, searching for better uh, methods and better algorithms. We need noise mitigation schemes to reduce the effect of the noise. We have to develop scaling up functionalities in order to be able to tackle problems of interest uh, uh, in, uh, say in, uh, in this community, for instance. Integration with HPC is becoming more and more important because I will show you later on, we develop schemes that integrates quantum and classical. So there will be one part of the problem solved with the classical computer and another part of the problem solved with the quantum computer. So the exponential hard part of the problem, exponentially hard part of the problem will be taken by the quantum computer and the rest will be, um, will be solved with a classical computer, right? Think about embedding in electronic structure calculations. You can have one part of the system that is handled by a quantum computer because you have strong correlated effect and the rest of your electrons may be treated well with density functional theory, for instance, right? And this is the reason why we are here with PANOS because we would like to integrate Qiskit, that is our, uh, uh, so software package for quantum algorithms with the classical drivers like Vanier, Quantum Espresso, in order to enable this crosstalk between HPC and quantum computing. Okay, and uh, this is uh, to go via the cloud because the quantum computer, we cannot bring it here. And the quantum computer needs conditions that uh, can only be um, so set in a, lab, uh, in, uh, in a lab, and therefore uh, we cannot uh, take it uh, uh, where we need it. Uh, so we need a cloud service that allows us to access uh, the quantum computer. Okay, so let's uh, uh, briefly introduce the, the technology that uh, we are uh, using at IBM. I don't want to spend much time here because uh, in the interest of time, I would like, I would prefer to move uh, uh, to the applications. So we use uh, superconducting qubits of uh, the transmon type, right? That have a potential energy surface that uh, is, is given here. You see that the potential energy surface is not harmonic and therefore the different uh, levels, energy levels are not equally spaced. And this is crucial because then you can use the ground state and the first excited states has uh, the level zero and one of uh, your qubit. Uh, and actually we are already working also with uh, some other excited states in order to be able to encode more information in a single qubit. So this is what will function as uh, a qubit. Uh, and then you need to entangle the qubits together. And for this operation, we use a microwave resonator that in this case uh, are instead have a, a harmonic potential with equally spaced levels. And uh, those devices are used for a readout for the entanglement of the qubits and also as a noise filter. Now you have qubits and you have the entanglers between uh, the qubits, then you can put all these together and then you get uh, your quantum device. Looks simple, but there are many technicalities, obviously, that uh, I don't uh, discuss here. If you want, we can have, uh, say, a discussion later on. In, in the, the problem with these devices uh, is that, uh, so the energy spacing here between uh, uh, the ground state and the first excited states is in the order of uh, five gigahertz that corresponds to 240 millikelvin. Okay, this means that if you want to avoid uh, thermal excitations or the excitations of your qubits, uh, you need to cool down the device to very low temperature. And this is why we cannot take it here because uh, at the moment, uh, these devices are operating at roughly 20 millikelvin. 
right? Again, in order to avoid uh, this kind of uh, uh, um, induced, uh, thermally induced uh, transitions. And uh, this is how uh, system one looks uh, like, uh, the first uh, in quotation mark commercial quantum computer from IBM. So you will have uh, your fridge that cools down the device at 20 millikelvins, and then you have all the electronics that is used to control the pulse sequences. Uh, and then uh, here the, the classical bits are sent to a classical computer for the interpretation of the results. Okay, so these are the devices that uh, we had available in 2021. So we started with five and we reached uh, 127 in 20, in, no, yeah, 127 in 21. And this year we will, uh, this is the roadmap for the next few years, uh, we will uh, reach uh, 440, uh, 430 qubits uh, this year. And uh, later on, we, we plan to, to, to cross uh, the 1000 qubit barrier uh, in uh, 2023. And there you get already something large enough uh, to encode uh, say, the first uh, logical qubit. So the error corrected uh, technology. And then using this uh, transductor that are uh, microwave to optical uh, um, yeah, transductor, you can entangle different uh, chips together and uh, transfer quantum information from one to the other. So entanglement, for instance. And in this way, start building piles of uh, quantum chips. OK. so. My contribution into this uh, is uh, the development uh, together with the team in Zurich of uh, the Qiskit uh, software uh, application modules. At the moment, we have uh, uh, functionalities in natural sciences, uh, including obviously material design and uh, electronic structure calculations, but we also have the modules in machine learning, uh, optimization, and so forth. Okay, so about Qiskit, I mean, Panos was here for uh, uh, the first part of, of uh, this uh, workshop. You know maybe already uh, quite a bit about it. So it's an open source uh, uh, effort by IBM. So everybody can uh, access, uh, download this code and test it. Uh, we have uh, a graphical interface. You want for beginners uh, where you have a qubit register and you can drag and drop uh, uh, gates and uh, measure your results. You can simulate the circuit or you can execute it directly on a quantum computer, right? Because some of uh, the machines are available to the public. So let's say the, the previous generation of uh, hardware is made available to the entire community for free. Only the, the, the newest machines, uh, the premium machines uh, are, uh, say, commercial. So you need to pay to access them. But for uh, learning uh, purposes, I think uh, this platform is really very useful for the more, uh, more advanced people, like obviously here, you can use Python scripts also to uh, prepare your algorithms, set your circuits and execute your circuits in simulations or directly on hardware. So for the developers, uh, we have uh, this uh, GitHub uh, repository where you can contribute uh, uh, your, uh, your code. Okay, so we also introduced recently this concept of uh, frictionless. Uh, um, so use of uh, the quantum computer meaning that uh, even if you are not an expert uh, on uh, quantum computing, quantum information, you can uh, use uh, with uh, just a few lines uh, a quantum algorithms and uh, collect uh, some results. You see, you need six lines of codes, for instance, uh, to get uh, the energy profile of the dissociation of lithium hydride, right? That's it's really... Um, we, we try to make uh, uh, Qiskit a tool for everybody so that uh, also a quantum chemist that uh, is not interested to look into what are these new technologies, uh, it can simply uh, 
call uh, these uh, few functionalities here and in a few lines uh, get already an experiment uh, done on a quantum computer. Okay, so let's move now towards the applications uh, and then we start uh, with applications in quantum mechanics. And uh, I would like to start with this quote by Richard Feynman that was essentially saying that uh, since uh, the nature at the fundamental level is quantum mechanic, then uh, why not using uh, quantum technology or try to use quantum technology to solve this problem instead of uh, classical technologies, right? And obviously quantum chemistry and physics uh, are therefore the natural target for quantum computers. However, quantum computer can also efficiently solve uh, some classes of problems and already mentioned before, we have uh, the proof that uh, with the Shor algorithm, you can have an exponential speed up in factoring numbers and also Grover search that uh, gives a quadratic speed up uh, in searching unstructured data, right? So that's uh, again, more uh, probably for fault tolerant quantum computing than near term quantum computing, but uh, also, there is uh, a lot to be done in this domain. So the solution of uh, classical problems, optimization problems, uh, statistical mechanics problems uh, with uh, uh, quantum computers. Okay. So uh, these are uh, some uh, near-term application modules that uh, we uh, made available on Qiskit. You can have modules to solve electronic structure calculations in the ground and excited states, plus also vibronic structures. We have uh, these uh, scaling up functionalities that uh, I will discuss also more in the details uh, later on. We have a uh, quantum machine learning uh, that can already be used, uh, for instance, uh, in, uh, uh, in the study of uh, molecular design. So in this case, we will work with uh, features instead of uh, uh, atomic structures, so, so we extract features and then we use a quantum machine learning to, uh, to extract knowledge uh, from these features. So this is also something very promising. We have uh, modules for uh, molecular design that maybe I will have time later on to, to talk about. We have already the possibility to perform ab initio molecular dynamics or so classical forces computing with ab initio methods. Lattice gauge theory, we have a collaboration with CERN on lattice uh, gauge theory that is going on since uh, more than two years now. Uh, classical problems, we have a module to solve, uh, uh, I mean to solve, to look at uh, protein folding on a lattice. Again, this is a classical problem. You have to be careful where uh, the quantum advantage can be in that in, in this kind in class of uh, problems uh, most probably you will not get more than a quadratic advantage but uh, i mean it's interesting to see how you can map these kind of problems into quantum register then we have quantum dynamics that uh, obviously is uh, something very interesting uh, for us because it's a quantum mechanical problem that is very hard to do it uh, classically and then we have quantum machine learning for energy physics Okay, so I will focus only on a couple of these. How much time do I still have? Zero minutes, right? Because we were, uh, sorry? You have. Okay. So in electronic structure, again, here I don't have to, to say anything about electronic structure. Theory, you know that uh, the, if you want the exact solution, the classical cost will be exponential in the number of orbitals. And instead the quantum algorithm, in principle, we scale like n to the four, and immediately you see the potential advantage of this approach. This is a quote from Matthias Troyer, who's saying that if you have uh, 125 orbitals and you want to store all possible configurations, uh, then uh, you need more uh, memory in your uh, classical computer than uh, there are atoms uh, in the universe. Obviously, we are not interested to store the wave function, right? Because if you know how to generate it, uh, then we don't need to store it, but if you would like to do that, uh, it would be definitely impossible already with uh, 125 uh, orbitals, right? And a quantum computer can do it easily instead. Okay, so uh, how do we solve problems in quantum chemistry? I will not go into the details, uh, 
well, we formulate the Hamiltonian in the second quantization uh, approach, so meaning that uh, the fermionic uh, uh, statistics is encoded in the rising and lowering operators. We pre-compute uh, the coefficients of the Hamiltonian in the basis, in the given basis with a classical computer. And this is again why we are here, because this has to be done by a classical driver and Vanier and all the codes linked to it could be a way of getting this, uh, these coefficients. Then uh, obviously the, the, the quantum computer working with qubits, they don't fulfill the fermionic statistics. So you need a transformation from uh, the fermionic statistics to the statistics of your uh, spins, so your uh, qubits. And for that, we use uh, the jordan Wigner transformation. There are many other uh, transformations that are uh, more efficient than the jordan Wigner, but the jordan Wigner is the easiest to, to write down. So it's the one that I took here. And then uh, you will have to introduce this transformation in, into the Hamiltonian. And for instance, for these two terms here, you will get uh, this uh, complicated uh, formula here below, obviously something that you don't want to do by hand. And therefore uh, here we have Qiskit uh, that uh, once given this Hamiltonian, it will transform it directly in a few seconds into uh, the same Hamiltonian. So it's isospectral to the previous one, but it will be now formulated in the language of the Pauli matrices. Okay, so that's is done for you and you don't have to bother about uh, all these processes here. Again, it's part of the frictionless uh, concept that I've introduced before. So, so far for the Hamiltonian, then uh, the, the, the wave function will be encoded into the quantum circuit. Sorry, the resolution here is not great, so probably you cannot read the details, but uh, I think it's good enough. So you start, uh, just to give you a, a flavor, you start with uh, uh, the artery focus later determinants in the occupation uh, numbers formalism. So you have uh, the first three occupied and the other two uh, unoccupied, and then uh, this would be an excited slater determinant where you take uh, the orbital, uh, the electron in orbital three, and you put it in four, and this is the double excitations. So you will build uh, your expansion, uh, your expansion up there. And, and, and these coefficients, uh, you can encode them into the rotations of your uh, single qubit operations. And then you will have to optimize uh, this uh, parameters in order to minimize the expectation value for your state right? with the Hamiltonian of the system. Okay, so to do that, we use the variational quantum eigensolver. We start again with the Hamiltonian, now given as a, a sum of Pauli strings in the language of the Pauli operators. The wave function will be encoded, as I showed you before, in the quantum circuit. And then what we do in the measurement process that I introduced in the second slide, we compute the expectation values of the single component of your Hamiltonian. We sum up everything and we have an expectation value for our energy that is parameterized on the thetas. The thetas are, again, the uh, angles on the block sphere of uh, our qubits. Then uh, we get from this operation, from reading this, we have the distribution. We use many shots in order to reduce the standard deviations of our distribution. And this will correspond to the energy that we give uh, to a classical computer to do a step in optimization. So then we modify the parameters theta, we send back the parameters theta to the quantum computer, he evaluates a new wave function with a new set of parameters. He will estimate the expectation value of your Hamiltonian it will send back this to a classical computer. This is again, one first example of the interplay between classical and quantum. These are hybrid uh, algorithms, so they need the quantum and the classical component. Here, the classical component is just doing the optimization of the parameters. And then you get your results. If you apply this algorithm to, for instance, here, the dissociation of N2, that in, in the, uh, at large distances has a strongly correlated character, then you see that uh, one of the most commonly used uh, uh, classical uh, uh, expansion of your uh, many electron wave function fails completely. This is uh, CCSD in the projective formalism. So it's well known to fail for these kind of molecules. So we'll give you this barrier 
when you try to bring the two uh, nitrogen atoms together, that is completely unphysical, the correct result should be the black curve there. And uh, the unitary copper cluster, the quantum unitary copper cluster algorithm, instead is able to capture correctly the, the right dissociation profile. Right? So with this, I don't want to claim that there is any quantum advantage so far. I just want to say that uh, there is something good right, in these algorithms, and they we will be able to use them also for larger systems, then we can get potentially a lot of benefit. So far on the hardware, we can do only smaller systems because of the errors that I mentioned before. So this is already uh, three years old results. So now we can do better. Uh, these are examples for uh, uh, the H2 and lithium hydride, where we use an error mitigation scheme in order to improve the quality of our results and uh, try to mitigate the errors that we do at the single qubits. You see that uh, we are not within chemical accuracy, but at least we capture the correct profile on hardware. One thing very important, if you want to have quantum advantage, you cannot get it by simulating your quantum algorithms. You need to run it on a quantum computer. Okay, so that's a very important point. So we can demonstrate uh, using simulations the power of our algorithms, uh, but if you really want to get out the quantum speed up, you need to execute the quantum algorithm on a quantum computer, whatever quantum computer is. Right? It can be superconducting qubits, it can be ions, spins, it can be whatever, atoms. Right? There are now many ways to build uh, quantum computers. Okay, so we have also the possibility once you have the ground state uh, using the equation of motion approach uh, to get excited states. You just need to measure many more things uh, with the ground state wave function that you have optimized. Then you can measure these other uh, quantities here where these are the excitation operators. Uh, and, uh, and then you get uh, this uh, matrix element, uh, you put them in this uh, um, pseudo eigenvalue problem and you solve it classically and will give you the excitation energies and, uh, and the coefficients <laughs> for the wave function expansion. And here you see, actually you don't see the reference lines, but uh, you can believe me that uh, the quality in simulations for uh, the excitation spectrum of uh, the hydrogen molecule, lithium hydride and water is indeed very good, right? So you cannot distinguish the exact from, uh, uh, from the calculated value. So, this is also something very promising because uh, maybe you are familiar with excited states. It's very hard to get good excited states for larger systems using uh, whatever method, right? It's always when you, when you have a new molecule, there's always a debate uh, what are the excited states because if you use TDDFT, you get some values. If you use uh, CASPT2, you get another value. If you use, uh, and I mean, everybody comes with different values because uh, we don't have an exact solution, right? So. It's very, and if quantum computer can help um, disentangling this, uh, this kind of things, I think uh, it would be really beneficial for the community. We have also experiments on excited states. These are, uh, uh, the, this is the ground state and the first four excited states of lithium hydride along the dissociation path. We are not within chemical accuracy, but uh, you see that uh, here you can see the reference, which are the dash line and the dots are our experiments uh, and they fit pretty well. So I would say that uh, there is some hope that uh, soon we can say something about excited states as well. Scaling up functionalities, maybe after that uh, I stop because I think I'm already 10 minutes, but okay, we start. Okay. So this is the idea, a very old idea, because you can have embedding, uh, for instance, of uh, a post artifoc method in density functional theory and artifoc. so it's nothing new. It's just that now we replace the active space part of the calculation. So we don't use a post artifoc method, but we use a quantum algorithm. So it works more or less like this. So the effective core potential, obviously, you can forget about. Then you have the valence electrons that you treat, for instance, with density functional theory, and only the electrons of interest, the catalytic one, the complicated one, the strongly correlated one. So you, you, you compute them with a the quantum algorithm. Right? And now we, are, uh, we have uh, this implementation 
So density, uh, quantum UCCSD or any type of uh, quantum uh, expansion of, uh, of your wave function embedded in artifoc or density functional theory using different packages by SCF, uh, CP2K. This is the collaboration with Jürg uh, at the University of Zurich, uh, Quantum Espresso and Vanier, I should add here, CPMD and NWCAM EX. And we would like to continue here. And Vanier could be really a way to get uh, um, interface to many of these classical codes. And also Vanier is crucial for us because uh, if you want to localize uh, the orbitals and the region of interest, uh, you need uh, a localization tool, right? Because uh, the drawback of an active space embedding scheme is that if your, uh, uh, if your orbitals are distributed overall the entire system, then you would need essentially to include all of them into the active space. So if you want really to, to, to get uh, some advantage uh, by using this method, you need to localize the orbitals where they are needed. And the Vanier functions is, is a good way to do that, right? I can rotate my orbitals so that they are maximally localized in space. And then using an, an active space uh, approach, uh, embedding approach, then I can leverage this kind of uh, localizations. That's great. So here are some applications. So this is uh, the last molecule that we could do a uh, full CI to get uh, the reference is oxyrane. And here is the stretch uh, along the CC bond. And obviously here you don't see the details. It doesn't matter. Obviously it performs great. Otherwise I will not show it. And uh, these are the orbitals, the, all the orbitals that you will need to uh, to use uh, to, to, to generate your wave functions. The one in black are uh, taken by the DFT and the one in red are the active, is the active space that is given to the quantum processor, right? And then depending on the size of your active space, you can approach as much as you want the reference line. Good. Um, yeah, very briefly, machine learning, I mentioned many times, is also a nice tool that we have. And how it works in this case is, uh, is that uh, is you try to bypass uh, the solution of the Schrodinger equation by teaching uh, a neural network about uh, uh, the molecules of, uh, that you are interested in. So instead of using the entire, say, uh, configuration space of your molecules, you just use a subset to, uh, to train a network by solving uh, the Schrodinger equation. And then for the remaining set of molecules, you bypass that and you use uh, uh, the neural network, for instance. And the nice thing is that uh, you can feed directly a wave function to a quantum neural network. And this you cannot do it classically. Classically, you extract features and then you ingest these features to the, the network or the classifier or whatever to, to your algorithm. In the case of a quantum computer, you can use directly the wave function to train the network. And you can even partition the molecule into pieces. Uh, this is done already classically and then solve your neural network for each of the pieces separately, combine the results and try uh, to get the, the the quantity of interest. In machine learning, we also we have also similar pipelines. We have interface Qiskit with uh, RDKit, that is one of these scheme informatics packages. You give molecules uh, as smiles, so you give strings uh, of uh, atoms and uh, information about the 3D structure of your molecule. From there, you extract features, uh, you compress them with uh, principal component analysis, and then you feed them to quantum computer, and here I would just like to get your attention on, on some of these results. So these results were done in collaboration with a, a group at the Artry Center in the UK that are specialized in this kind of algorithms. So we use uh, some data sets, don't ask me about the details of these data sets, but our data sets used routinely by them to train uh, machine learning, in this case, uh, uh, support vector machines to classify molecules. So you will teach uh, your uh, um, neural network uh, or uh, 
whatever. So your uh, quantum, uh, your classical machine learning algorithm to recognize properties of molecules, and then uh, you screen an entire database uh, to to and try to classify the good and the bad in a way, right? And if you use uh, the classical approaches here in blue, this is the score. So how good uh, is uh, the performance of your algorithm? And you see that uh, classically is always inferior than the quantum. So the quantum can already, for these very small test cases, outperform, not uh, by much, but uh, significantly, the classification of the best known classical approaches. And these, there is really no bias uh, because these calculations were done by experts in the field of uh, uh, drug discovery using classical approaches. So again, there is some, uh, I mean, potential for quantum advantage also in this kind of approaches, already now with near-term quantum computing. And then here I, I just browse very quickly to Another important topic that is quantum dynamics in first and uh, in, in grid based or second quantization framework. Uh, we have uh, proterization of the time evolution operator or this uh, variational type uh, uh, solver of the dynamics uh, using McLachlan variational principles. And uh, we have uh, integrated both. Uh, framework, first quantization, second quantization, uh, using uh, this type of uh, solvers for the dynamics. The limitation of the classical algorithms that they will scale uh, uh, exponentially with the size of the system. So remember that the vibronic structures are computed in the configuration space of a molecule, so it's three n-dimensional. So, and uh, the, uh, the classical algorithm scales as n to the m, where n is the number of grid points and m is the number of the dimensions. So this is a killer for classical algorithms, while the, the quantum algorithm scales m log n. So that's, you see that there is a huge potential in solving these classes of problems with a quantum computer. And also in second quantization, the classical will scale exponential to uh, the number of modes, Instead, the quantum will be poly n in the number of, uh, of modes that you have in the system. A lot of potential. We have done implementations of the spin boson model, and we can have uh, so a good understanding about the, the effect of the noise in this case. But also, we have uh, now implemented uh, uh, quantum dynamics in a grid based setup was not easy because of many technicalities, but now we are working and it's stable. And uh, I'm very happy to show this because I was working with classical methods on this kind of dynamics for many, many years. And now I can do it again also with the quantum computer. So that was really very nice for me. This is a um, test case is the dynamics uh, uh, without any external potential. This is a, an, an harmonic potential. So you don't see the, the potential here. And this is a very tough one, is the scattering of a wave packet uh, against an Eckhart barrier, where you have a uh, part of your wave packet that is tunneling across the barrier and part is reflected. So to do it classically, I can tell you is a nightmare, right? But uh, uh, now we have a stable algorithm that can do it uh, in, uh, in uh, say, uh, using polynomial uh, number of resources. In order to do that, we need to, to introduce some tricks, but uh, they are really working fine. Okay, we have also non adiabatic dynamics, but I don't have time, and I thank you for, uh, for your attention. Okay, so thank you very much for the great talk. Now we have uh, quite some time for questions and comments, so please raise your hand if you have a... So, quick, quick one. Uh, very nice, first of all. Uh, is the you, you do the measurement by the amplitude and the phases are irrelevant. This has to do with the first part of how you read the thing. Is the phase of the wave functions irrelevant? No, uh, the global phase, no, uh, no. So we we simply project uh, the, the state on the different uh, realizations, right? So that are the bit strings. And the the individual phases are not, no, not at that level, no, no. Yeah. 
Yeah, so we have a few participants connected online, so we'll read the question. <laughs> That's a question that I don't want to take. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> Kemal Atalar is asking, for which problem calculation do you think the first practical quantum advantage will be achieved? Where would you would choose quantum computers over classical? I mean, it's a very, very complicated question. I mean, we are working a lot on quantum chemistry, but quantum chemistry, you need, in quantum chemistry, you need uh, really high accuracy, right? This famous uh, chemical accuracy, one kilocal per mole or something like this, uh, few milli artery, and we have noisy devices. So for us, it's very hard to reduce the noise uh, below this uh, chemical accuracy. But still, uh, energy is not the only thing that you want to measure in a system, right? So you can measure excited states, gaps, uh, and there, obviously, you will have uh, some, uh, say, cancellation of errors, most probably. You can measure uh, spin gaps. Uh, you can measure, uh, so uh, you can also use these approaches uh, for uh, solving the dynamics of the Hubbard model. So I think that there is uh, a lot of potential in solving quantum problems with a quantum computer. This is nothing new, but uh, what is probably new is that uh, we hope to be able to show something using near-term quantum computers. So, so this quantum advantage. Then, then quantum machine learning is also very promising because there the answer is zero and one, for instance, if you have a classifier. And therefore it's also more resilient to noise, right? Because even if, uh, I mean, you do some errors in measuring your circuit, since your answer is only zero one, maybe, and the problems that, uh, I mean, the, the, the applications that I show is they are pointing in this direction that, uh, I mean, these algorithms are very resilient to noise and therefore you can really leverage the advantage of the quantum circuit uh, that uh, gives more expressivity uh, for your cost functions. And uh, what else? So instead for classical problems, optimization problems is not really my business uh, to look into that. Uh, uh, there are, uh, as I mentioned, some algorithms that uh, will provide a quantum advantage, but the depth that you need is such that uh, uh, you cannot implement them with near-term quantum computing. You have to wait for fault-tolerant quantum computing. This is further away in time. We have another <clears throat> questions here. Thanks for a really, really nice talk. Uh, one of the ways in uh, our field that we um, justify what we do is we say that it's uh, uh, less expensive to do a density functional theory calculation than to go and measure the material in an experiment. Now, in one of your slides, you show the dissociation curve of lithium hydride measured by experiment and the excited state. So you, know, you can do the experiment. Can you comment on the relative uh, ease and cost of building a quantum computer at 20 millikelvin versus actually going and measuring the quantum system directly. Yeah. Okay. Um, there were studies about that. A quantum computer, despite the fact that you these kind of quantum computers, you have to cool them to mere 20 millikelvins, they don't consume much power because they are based on superconducting technology. So there is no heat dissipation, right? And bringing down to 20 millikelvin doesn't cost much. It was a surprise for me, but these uh, calculations were done by other people independent from my. Exactly, yeah, you have to have helium three, but then you can do it at a relatively modest cost. So it will not use a lot of power. So they did comparison. Uh, so for fault tolerant quantum computing, uh, the, the power that you would need to solve a problem classically with the quantum computer, and there are order of magnitudes more efficient the quantum but you have to get there, right? Yeah. Well, I guess not just the power, but I mean, the time to solution or? The time to solution or? No, versus doing the experiment, measuring the quantum system directly. I'm measuring the quantum so system directly. Yeah. Measure the experimentally. No, experimentally, I mean uh, on a quantum computer. For me, the experiment is the quantum computer calculation, right? It's not the experiment uh, using uh, I mean, photons yeah, or. Yeah. Sorry, 
uh, just a quick comment. This, all these things are done automatically for you. So you don't have any experimental complexity here. You just ask to measure a Hamiltonian and Kiski takes care of doing everything for you. So if you are referring to this kind of complexity of doing an experiment. No, no, no. I my question. No, I mean, his question was about. Uh, I, I, yeah, no, no, uh, sure. Sure, you can measure it. Uh, but, but then the same question applies why we are doing classical calculations, uh, if you can measure. No, I, I, Ah, absolutely. I mean, this is uh, way more e uh, easier. I mean, if you believe on, on your equations and you, that you, can, you can trust them, then the numbers that we'll extract from these calculations uh, would, say, match the reality. I mean, we don't want to enter into philosophy, right? But uh, this is exactly the same. So this, instead of running this on an HPC, you will run it on a quantum computer. It will give you an answer. If you did a good job in setting up uh, the right theory, the right algorithm, and uh, the right way you execute uh, your algorithm on the quantum, then you will get uh, a good result in a time that uh, is uh, much less, obviously, than by setting up uh, an experiment. And the experiments are beautiful. They always correspond to the truth. but the conditions are not always the one that uh, you would like to know. I mean, if you want to study a molecule that is in your body in a lab, uh, you have to make uh, many, <laughs> many steps in order to isolate it. And uh, I mean, your environment will be completely different. Uh, in calculations, we try to uh, simulate the molecules in, uh, in a realistic environment. So, I mean, it's true that the experiments uh, are beautiful and we should always look at them as a reference, but they also have drawbacks, right? No, 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 so I agree with everything you said. Maybe it's a point of conception of atmosphere building a quantum computer. Maybe higher than it actually can I mean, once, once you make a quantum computer, you can use it to solve infinite problems. An experiment, you have to set up always a new one for, uh, I mean, not always, but uh, so many. Yeah. Now, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, fully agree. Yeah, cool yeah, agree. Measuring the Yeah, I mean, experiments are always there, and it's good that uh, we are investing a lot in doing always better and better experiments. But for me, calculations are important because they are uh, our. Yeah. <laughs> and, and this, uh, I mean, think about uh, the same question 50 years ago when they were building the first transistors, right? Is worth investing in these uh, experiments and trying to do this uh, very, uh, if uh, you can do an experiment, right? Yes, it was worth investing in this because now we have uh, high performance computers, right? And here is the same now that looks very, uh, um, complicated technologies, but the hope is that we will bring them to the point that uh, they will be root, routinely built uh, easily and uh, that everybody can have access and do the calculations on that point. Okay, so we have a question from Giovanni. Thanks a lot, uh, really very nice talk. Uh, I have a question also related to say the speed and the, maybe the specific example lithium hydride. And again, I understand we don't have quantum, uh, it's not faster than a classical computer probably, but can you give orders of magnitude, like for instance, in this specific example for lithium hydride with respect to the classical algorithm, let's say how, how long it takes, and maybe also what are currently the bottlenecks and what is the roadmap? For instance, I'm imagining, I don't know, this is also a question, there is, will be a latency for transferring data between classical and quantum, or do we, we have to do a lot of measurements, so maybe, how fast can we do these measurements? How many do you have to really need? You have you know, yeah. orders of magnitude, maybe? Yeah, these are all very important questions. Thanks a lot. So uh, if you, I don't tell you <laughs> how much time it takes to, <laughs> obviously it's huge, right? But uh, there is no limitations in squeezing this time uh, down to something reasonable. Already last year, we got uh, 100 times faster uh, approach to that. Also because uh, the classical computers and the quantum computers are not sitting uh, next to each other, right? 
So then you have to go via the cloud uh, and you transfer data, all the things that we are mentioning. But now we are uh, trying to, with the runtime approach, to bring the classical on top of the quantum, right? So that very close, essentially, even with shared memory between the two. Right. And in that case, uh, obviously, you can reduce all these latencies uh, to the minimum. Okay. To do what? To do. It will be negligible compared to the time that you need to read out uh, the state. Yeah, this will go below that threshold. How many measurements are used for and how fast? Uh, we do for each expectation value. We do at the moment ten thousand measurements. The coherence time of uh, of our device is in the order of one hundred microseconds. So then uh, you have to multiply one hundred microseconds by one thousand, uh, ten thousand, and then you know how long it takes uh, to get uh, a single shot. Apart from the coherence time, it's very fast time to set up multiple times. Yeah, then you need time for reinitialization of your state every time. I mean, yeah, there are some, but, but yeah. <coughs> like. Other questions? Thank you for the talk, very nice. Um, my question is about the correlation length uh, for example, in chemistry, right? You have uh, an active space and your correlated uh, space is quite small, but I can think about materials where your correlation length is, is uh, much larger or needed near a critical point, for example. Uh, sure. What, can, you, can you comment about that? And yeah, the, uh, for that, you will have to wait a bit longer <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because if we can localize the system nicely, uh, then we can use a few orbitals to be started. I mean, if you have a very delocalized state of interest and uh, can be described with uh, a few delocalized orbitals, you can still use the same approach, right? But if the system is large, uh, the states are very packed, you have a band, <laughs> then in that case, you would need uh, many qubits in order to describe these kind of situations. There's no way out. I mean, uh, an embedding scheme would not be good. But, but then you can use first quantization approaches instead of second quantization approaches. This will come. Or a plane waves, right? We use a different basis set than orbital uh, atomic based. Other questions? Maybe I, I have one, one last question. So when you show the Grover algorithm at some point, yeah. it was like, and and, I, and I'm asking this because you, I saw you mentioned Matthias Troyer uh, in some, some, some context. So once uh, I was uh, attending a, a talk by him, and he said that yes, that it, you know this this search in an algorithm in a database it will be very very efficient. The problem is the I/O that you need to read the entire. Oh, yeah, database. yeah, sure, sure, yeah. So I was wondering, I mean. This Even is, when there is a clear speed up, would the I/O kill, you know, most uh, of the in, in the case of uh, quantum mechanics, no. Okay. Right? Because quantum mechanics, if you use uh, this uh, occupation number representation, then each state uh, is a bit string. You prepare your bit okay. string and you send. So it's really a bit of information that you have to input uh, uh, to your quantum computer. In the case of uh, Grover algorithm, obviously, <laughs> I mean, the way you input the data is uh, is critical okay. right if you if you want to find a name in the phone book uh, and uh, you have to enter all the, the names one by one obviously at the time uh, you, <laughs> you you go through the name that you are looking at um, because you were inputting all the data you have it already right okay. so you do even not have to, to search for it right? okay. so um, this is uh, this can be a problem when you need to uh, input a quantum register uh, many, many data. So we have ways to um, to load the distribution efficiently into quantum compute, right? So that can be done. You can load functions. You can load, for instance, uh, partition functions, mm -hmm. stuff like that. You can, can do it. Obviously, you have to discretize space and like this, but there are algorithms to do that. But if you have to input, uh, say, letters, and these letters, you have to digitalize them, uh, so your alphabet and like this, uh, uh, then really 
you need many, many qubits to do that. Okay. Thanks. Uh, any other questions? Let me see if there's anyone online. No. So then if not, we can thank again Ivano for the great talk.